to the Recovery Effect podcast with Bill Vineyard. Recovery is Bill's passion and his life's work of 30 plus years. Now it's your turn to experience the Recovery Effect, a powerful mix of recovery, spirituality, philosophy, and most importantly, living life as your true self. Now here's your host, Bill Vineyard. Recovery Effects podcast listeners, great to be with you today. I'm really excited about this podcast today because we're going to deal with the single most important thing that it takes to recover from alcoholism and drug addiction, and it's pretty exciting. I hope you stay with me. But before we get going, I want to make clear a couple of things. One is that I believe in the 12-step program. I believe in it because it has worked for me and I've seen it work for thousands of others. I also believe in God. Why? Because it's worked for me, and because I've seen it work for thousands of others. So now that we're on an honest playing field, let's get into our podcast today, which is talking about the single most important but yet elusive concept there is in recovery, and that is to admit and accept the concept of powerlessness. It's elusive because one thinks they have it, only to find out later that they didn't. And the proof of that lies in the fact that they keep relapsing. I believe that every single relapse can be traced back to the fact that they never admitted and accepted their powerlessness. I don't think there's any alcoholic or addict that takes a drink or a shot of dope that doesn't feel they have some kind of control, some kind of power over that chemical they're just getting ready to use. An alcoholic might say, I'm going to step into the bar and have a couple of drinks and then go home. That's saying they have some kind of control, some kind of power. A drug addict might say that I'm going to smoke this dope this weekend, and come Monday, I'm not going to smoke any till next weekend. Again, thinking they have some kind of power or control. I believe every relapse, every use can be traced back to this inability to accept and admit their powerlessness. You ever wonder why that this concept of powerlessness is so elusive, that one can say they're powerless? and not really know that they are? Haven't you ever had this happen to you? Somebody had told you something, you know, your dad or your mom or your grandparents had told you something, you thought you knew it, and then years later it happened and you go, that's what they were talking about. You just really realized what you thought you knew. Powerlessness is like that. It's so sneaky. Powerless kind of tells you, yeah, you know you're powerless, but in truth, you don't. And you continue to relapse and wonder why. It's so elusive. Another reason it's elusive is because not being in control is terrifying. No one wants to admit that they're not in control of something that's destroying their life. And another reason for its elusiveness is the ego. How many times have you said or heard others say that once I put my mind to it, I know I can stop drinking? Because I've been able to do everything I put my mind to. We just don't want to admit that we're weak. And our egos won't let us get beyond that. Our ego will simply not let us accept enough humility to realize that we can't stop. That we're weak in that area. I had a woman come up to me one time after I'd given a lecture on this concept. And she said, Bill, don't you think God in AA is a crutch? And I said, yeah. It is, but that ain't bad if you're crippled. But that's hard for the ego to let us admit that we're crippled in regards to our inability to stop drinking or drugging. And the last reason it's so elusive is simply the person does not want to stop drinking or drugging. They just don't want to admit powerlessness because they know it's going to lead to sobriety and they're just not ready to give up their use. I have run into a number of alcoholics who will tell me that they know they're powerless once they once they start drinking. They know they can't stop. But see, they haven't realized that they're powerless before they start drinking. I read a story one time and that Bill Wilson wrote. I think it was in AA Comes of Age, but I'm not sure. Anyway, he tells about Dr. Silkworth being the medical director of this drying out place, which was nothing more than a two-story big house, I think. And what Dr. Silkworth discovered was that once the alcoholic got sober, they acted and reacted like all normal human beings, that they were good people, responsible people, as long as they weren't drinking. 
And so he come up with the idea that alcoholics have an allergy to alcohol. That once they ingest alcohol into their system, they have a chemical reaction to that chemical that makes them act and react different than normal people. They also have an obsession of the mind that one is too many and a thousand's not enough, that they just can't stop drinking once they take that first drink. Well, he explained this allergy of the body and this obsession of the mind to Bill Wilson. And Bill was so happy to learn what was wrong with him. He said he couldn't wait to tell his wife, Lois, that he had found out his problem. Well, after he was released from Towns Hospital, he stayed sober quite a few months. And one day he decided to go golfing at the county golf course. As he was riding on the bus, there was a guy sitting next to him. And for some odd reason, Bill told this guy all his story. Bill told him about how alcohol had ruined his career, how it hurt his wife, how they were sleeping on mattresses on the floor, and how his wife was working in a five-and-dime department store in order to make ends meet. He said the bus had a wreck, and they all had to get off and wait for another one to come along. There was a restaurant bar there, so they decided him and his new best friend to go in there and have a sandwich. As they were eating their sandwich, it was May Day, and someone had set up the whole restaurant bar with drinks. When the waitress set Bill's drink in front of him, he reached down and picked it up, getting ready to take it. When his friend says, are you going to drink that? After all you've told me, you must be insane. And Bill told him, I am, and took that drink, which eventually led him back to Towns Hospital in order to get detoxed with Dr. Silkworth. Well, as the good doctor and Bill was going over the events that led up to him drinking, they come to a very vital and important conclusion. And that was that not only was Bill powerless after he took the first drink, he was powerless before he took the first drink. That Bill could not stop the insane thinking that always precedes that first drink. This was an incredible discovery. We have to accept the fact that we're not only powerless once we take that first drink or that first shot of dope, we're powerless before we do that. That there's no way we can stop that insane thought that enters our mind that convinces us that things are going to be different this time, that we're not going to act crazy, or that we're going to be able to stop smoking our dope after a day or two. Yes, sir, the problem seems to be centered in our mind. And until this concept of powerlessness is accepted deep within our innermost self, recovery will be extremely difficult. Because you see, powerlessness needs to be experienced. It just can't be taught. It's not a mental exercise like learning the dates of history. It's something that needs to be experienced. And I feel like this podcast can help one get closer to that experience But that experience is an individual experience that needs to be experienced by the person themselves. But one thing I can do, and that's to prove the concept of powerlessness. Yes, I said prove it. And if you stick with me to the end of this, I think you'll be convinced. A really good example in our journey in proving the concept of powerlessness was that one night I was in group, and there was this woman who was crying profusely because she had just lost her children over her meth addiction. As I was sitting there listening to her talk and the tears rolling down her eyes, I realized that she was in a lot of pain and a great deal of remorse. I mean, she was feeling a lot of guilt over this. And she was honest and sincere. She wasn't playing a game. There was nothing to gain by what she was doing. She wasn't trying to excuse her behavior away or blame anyone else. She accepted full responsibility for the loss of those children. As I was sitting there listening to her, I realized that she possessed all the components in regards to being a good mother. She had the want to. She desperately wanted to be a good mother. She had the knowledge. You could tell she was raised right and she had knowledge of how to be a good mother. She had the love for those children, that was obvious, and she had the ability to be a good mother. So what the heck was going on? Well, I realized that she can't be a good mother, that her addiction won't let her, that she's totally lost the power of choice when it comes to being a good mother or not. Her addiction has made the choice for her. 
How did I reach this conclusion? Simply from the fact that she can't be who she is. She can't do what she wants to do. It's obvious that she's a good mother. It's obvious that she wants to do the things that's required to be a good mother. She just can't. She wants to raise her children, but can't. And when I looked at her, I could see she was a good mother. She just can't be who she is. It's as if there's a good mother inside of her that can't get out because of this meth addiction that's keeping her in there. Of course, at one time in her life, she could have chosen not to use meth. She could have chose not to let meth rule her life. But once she chose that, she lost the power to choose the other. It's like a girl having two lovers. She has to make a choice. Well, she makes it. Once it's made, the other one leaves. Well, let's say that she stays with this choice she made for a few months, maybe a few years. But eventually she realizes that she made the wrong decision. She can't go back and redo that decision. That choice is already over. She no longer has that same choice. The man that she thinks she wants now has moved on. He's married, has children. He's building his life. The choice just isn't there anymore. It no longer exists. Of course, the woman in group didn't make that choice to use meth, knowing that she would be powerless at a later date knowing that she would lose her children or that she could get addicted in her first use of meth. She didn't have all that information. Maybe she was just out with her friends. Maybe she thought, well, one time won't hurt me. But with meth being a highly addictive drug, it only takes one time for some people to get addicted to it. As I was sitting there thinking about all this stuff, I finally asked her. I said, do you want to be a good mother? And she said, yes. I then asked her why she hadn't been. And she looked me square in the eye and said, I don't know. And you know, that was the truth. She didn't know. She didn't know why she couldn't quit. She didn't know why she was the way she was. She was confused as anyone. I then told her, I said, you know, I think there's three types of mothers that would do what you've done to your children. The first one is an evil mother, a mother who totally disregards her children, a mother who might even enjoy hurting them, a mother who places them in danger with little regard for their life. That's an evil mother. The other one's a psychotic mother. This is the mother who's mentally incapable of taking care of her children. She's mentally ill. She has neither the ability nor the mental capacity to be a good mother. I then asked her if she felt she was either of these two. She said she didn't think she was, and the group agreed. They felt that she was neither the psychotic or the evil mother. I said, then you must be the third type, and that's the no-choice mother. That's the mother who has no choice that the addiction has taken away their power of choice. And the addiction dictates what kind of mother they're going to be. No matter how bad the mother wants to be a good mother, she is left with no choice as she is a slave to the addiction that's controlling her life. I don't want to hurt my children, but does. I don't want to hurt my parents, but does. I don't want to go to jail, but goes to jail. Because mess says, you do what I say. I don't do what you say. I have the power over you. You don't have the power over me. What a dilemma to find oneself in. These people go to professionals, hoping and praying that they'll find out what's wrong with them and unlock the right door that will allow them to be good people, to allow them to make the right choices. I know that Nowadays, there's this big movement on cognitive behavioral therapy, helping people think through things, therefore hoping they make the right choice. 
Even if the alcoholic and addict would do a cognitive exercise before they drink, I have serious doubts that that would be enough to prevent them from using. I have sat in group time after time after time again, watching people come into my treatment center when they've had two to three, sometimes ten treatments prior. And when they sit down, they'll go, I made poor choices. I just need to learn how to make better choices. And once they say that, I automatically know that they've been to treatment before. And I'll ask them that. Have you had treatment before? And they go, yeah. And I said, are they the ones that told you that you needed to make better choices? And they'll say yes. And it angers me that our society, along with our professionals, are taking this type of attitude towards the addict. I mean, look, you look at a meth head, his teeth falling out, his hair is turned to straw, he's homeless, he gets got out of jail, he's lost his family, they no longer want anything to do with him, he's sleeping under a bridge, his clothes are raggedy, he's staying in homeless shelters when he can. You think he's doing this by choice? Do you honestly think that if he could make another choice, he wouldn't? He would choose that way of life? I assure you that if they, if he was able to make a different choice than the one he's living right now, he would make it. No one, and I mean absolutely no one, wants to live like that. I can't count the number of times that I've experienced people showing up in the courtroom drunk. The judge is ready to sentence him, and the guy staggers up to the podium waiting for the sentence. Incredible. Numerous times probation officers have called me and told me that the person showed up for their probation hearing high. These are not choices these people are making on their own free will. No one would make that. Surely they know they just show up in the courtroom sober and their probation hearing clean. They know that. They just can't choose to do that. I learned this fact from a very painful and haunting experience that still haunts me today. Years ago, I opened up a treatment center, which they classified as intermediate. It was a first of its kind. It was in between inpatient and outpatient treatment. It consisted of a person living there, but they were allowed to go to work and then come straight back and they received their treatment on evenings and weekends, and it gave them a chance to get out of their environment, but also helped them continue to support their family and be financially responsible. There was this little old guy that was there, and he was a painter. And I remember the first night he came back, I could smell alcohol on his breath. I told him, I said, look, I realize that this is your first night here, and I smell alcohol on you. But don't come back to this facility again with alcohol on your breath. Well, lo and behold, the next night I got up next to him, and guess what I smelled? Alcohol. I pulled him into my office, and I gave him a old one, two, three punch and told him that if he came back again like that, I was going to discharge him. The very next night, that guy had alcohol on his breath. I told him to pack up and leave. I told him that he obviously did not want what we had to offer, and he needed to leave. It was about supper time, and it was raining outside, but I went ahead and walked across the street to a restaurant that I ate at. As I was sitting there at the table eating, I looked up, and there was this little old guy, the painter, motioning for me to come over and talk to him. I walked over and looked at his soaked white t-shirt, his hair matted down, and he was begging me to let him stay, not to discharge him. But I told him I couldn't. I told him I'd give him three chances and three strikes and you're out. So he went back and packed his stuff up and left. I got a call about two weeks later from his wife. She told me he had committed suicide. He'd shot himself in the head. This devastated me. I remember sitting in my office going over the part that I might have played in this. 
This is a painful road to go down, but I knew for some reason I had to go down it. And then it hit me what I'd done wrong. The reason he continued to come back to the facility with alcohol on his breath is because he couldn't quit. He couldn't stop. And I failed to see that. I failed to realize that. If I would have realized that, it would have been better for both him and I. If I'd have put him in detox or even jail, he might be alive today. I don't know that to be true, but I do know one thing. I never made that mistake again. So, even though the alcoholic and drug addict has lost the power of choice when it comes to using, does this mean he's hopeless? In no way does it mean that. Sure, he's lost the power of choice over his addiction, but he does have one choice left, only one, and that is, is he willing to work the program that will bring about sobriety or not? That's it. Before him is the choice to work the program that brings about recovery or not to work the program and stay the way he is. He doesn't have a choice to be a better father or a better mother, a better son, a better daughter, a better employee, a better human being, because the addiction will not let you be that. That isn't even a choice. You can't be any of those things when you're still drinking and drugging. An alcoholic and drug addict is like a person with diabetes. They're diabetic. That's a given. That's over. There's no longer a choice. Am I diabetic or not? Your only choice left is what are you going to do about it? Are you going to diet and exercise? Are you going to take your insulin or not? That's the only choice the diabetic has. Do they have a choice to be a diabetic or not? No. Do they have a choice to take their medication or not? Yes. Does the alcoholic and drug addict have a choice of being powerless or not? No. Do they have a choice in working the program of recovery? Yes. I personally am on intimate terms with powerlessness. We're very, very close. We came close to each other about 37 years ago when I'd been drinking for a couple of weeks real heavy. One morning I got up and I threw up in the sink in the bathroom and noticed blood. I told myself what I'll do is I'll just taper off today and I'll go to bed tonight and when I wake up, I just won't drink anymore. I was trying to prevent withdrawals. Well, that didn't work. I was drunk that night. The next morning I get up, I throw up again, and there's more blood. And it happened the next night. Each time I had a plan of tapering off, going to bed, getting up the next day, and not drink. Well, the fourth morning I got up and I threw up, there was a lot of blood in there. And I said to myself, what I'll do is I'm just going to really taper off today. I'm going to go to bed tonight. And when I get up tomorrow, I won't drink. Well, that night I was sitting on my floor drinking heavily. I was drunk. But I had a moment of clarity, what they call a moment of truth. It was I was like cold stone sober. And I thought to myself, I've tried everything in the world to quit drinking. I guess can't go on like this anymore. Life was just too painful. I've got to end this. So I went into my bedroom, got under my mattress, pulled out my gun, came back out and sat in the living room, took a big drink of whiskey and chased it with beer, put the gun up to my head. And as I raised the gun up to my head, this thought entered my mind. And it said, what if you kill yourself? and live in this state for eternity. And it shocked me. I thought, I don't want to live like this forever. I'm trying to get out of this pain. So I set the gun down. And I thought to myself, I can't keep on drinking. It's killing me. I'm miserable. I can't keep drinking. And then a miracle happened. At the same moment that I realized that I can't keep drinking, I finally realized that I couldn't stop. Those two concepts, those two ideas 
came at the same time. I couldn't get, keep drinking and I couldn't stop. And then I thought, that's what those old guys talk about in AA. That's what they mean by powerlessness. I can't do either one. And then terror filled my whole body. I thought, what am I going to do? And I remember those guys talking about God. And I crawled over to the couch and I said, God, please help me. If you get me sober again, I promise you I'll never get myself in this shape again. And this overwhelming feeling came over me and said, I'm going to get you sober one more time. But if you take one more drink, we're done. I know what it means when people say, I've got one more drunk left in me, but I don't have another sobering up. They know that if they drink again, they won't get sober. I knew that right then. It scared me so bad that I got up, I dumped out all my beer and all my whiskey down the drain. And I'm telling you folks, I needed that. That's how frightened I was. Upon this complete defeat, this realization at a deep, deep level that I can't stop drinking, that I'm powerless, I've been able to build a very good life. I was able to go back to college, marry, have four children, a beautiful home, be a good member in my community and help people for the past 37 years. As Father Martin used to say, I came to a point where I realized I can't, God can't, and I think I'll let him. Take a moment and go back over your life a little bit and try to remember the worst three things that you've done when you was drinking and drugging. It might be painful, but go ahead and try to bring it to mind. And I want you to ask yourself this one question. Would I have done that? if I wouldn't have been drunk or high? Is that a choice that I would have made to hurt my parents or to hurt my family like that? Would I have made that choice if I was free of this disease? I doubt if you would have. You're a better person than that. And you know that. And if you answer that question and say, no, I wouldn't have done that, then you must realize that you too have lost the power of choice. And you too must be willing to accept defeat, to throw the towel in. Alcohol and drugs is one. You are powerless. They do have the power. And if you're willing to do that, willing to admit and accept defeat, accept your powerlessness and want to join the program of recovery, it will be reflected in your behavior. It will be reflected in what you do. Are you willing to pray every day? Are you willing to go to meetings? Are you willing to get a sponsor? Are you willing to work the steps? Are you willing to read the literature? If you're doing those things, then you've become willing. If you're not doing those things, then you're unwilling. And not too much is going to change for you. Because the decisions we make are reflected in our behavior. If you say that you've made the commitment, but yet you're not doing those things that bring about recovery, then you're just lying to yourself and you're delusional. So the decision's yours. You have this one choice left. If you suffer from alcoholism or drug addiction, you don't have the choice to be the person you want to be or to quit, to not drink or to drink. You have the choice whether you're willing to do what it takes to recover or not. So as we close, I'll leave you with something that meant so much to me, especially when I first got sober. And it goes something like this. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. May God bless you and may you always have enough. Thanks for listening to The Recovery Effect with Bill Vineyard. Check out more at therecoveryeffect.com and facebook.com slash therecoveryeffect. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes.